Hello students, welcome to Morality Chapter 3, Lesson 1. Um, in Chapter 3 of your Morality book, we're going to cover the following pages, 119 through 126, 129 through 131, and 134 through 141. The first um, lesson is going to focus on the idea of freedom. The chapter is about um, the law and the idea of the law as a pathway to freedom. So the first topic in our chapter will be the topic of freedom. Sorry, that's kind of hard to see. I should have chose a different color. Um, our learning objectives will be to uh, define freedom external and internal license and determinism. We'll also justify the claim that freedom isn't the same as license and explain the role, explain the role emotions play in living our freedom. Our um, first activity was Classwork 3.16, The Harm Principle. Um, students watched a video um, about the harm principle and then we had a discussion assignment um, associated with that, which I'll show you now. So if we go to the main page for the course, okay, I'm trying to get, come on, there we go. And we scroll down, we're working out of this purple folder here, um, unit two, chapter three. And if you go to classwork and discussions like we always do, here it is. Um, this is uh, Classwork 3.16, The Harm Principle. This is what we did for our first um, warm-up in class. So if you open this up, you'll see the assignment here um, was to watch the video on the harm principle and answer these two questions. What with the Catholic response to Milby and why. And even if you're not sure, take a guess and think about it. What's your personal opinion of Mill's, Mill's idea? Do you think, do you agree the harm principle is a good standard for morality? Why or why not? And if I scroll down, you can see um, some of the student responses here. Um, so I'm going to play the video for those of you who are absent so that you can see it. And then... Um, you can uh, add your own discussions to the discussion post. John Stuart Mill argues for one simple principle, the harm principle. It amounts to this. The state, my neighbors, and everyone else should let me get on with my life as long as I don't harm anyone in the process. One way of thinking of this is my freedom to swing my fist ends at the tip of your nose. If I don't have dependence, I should be free to drink myself to an early death, live as an eccentric, or explore alternative lifestyles, as long as no one else is damaged in the process. Paternalism is okay towards children. They need protecting, but never towards adults who are of sound mind. So let me get on with my experiments of living, and you get on with yours. And even if I'm wrong about the best way to live... It's better to let me make my own mistakes. This individual freedom is the seedbed of genius. It's also the basis of enduring happiness for ordinary people. It needs protecting. Mill favors free speech, too, up to the point where it inflames violence. It's not just what you say, but also where and when you say it that matters. But merely causing offense, he thinks, is no grounds for intervention, because in his view, that is not a harm. He champions dissent because it keeps us on our intellectual toes and stops our beliefs congealing into dead dogma. We need a variety of views to think well. Censorship is the enemy of progress. Not everyone agrees, of course. Critics of Mill's liberalism think he went too far. Our lives are more enmeshed with others than he realized. And some speech causes deep psychological harm. Harm that can be as damaging as a fist in the face. Okay, so um, having watched the video, uh, the link is at the bottom of the assignment uh, if you want to watch it again if it went too fast. But 
again, it was classwork 3.16, and the students watched the video, um, and then uh, we discussed their reactions to the harm principle. So uh, the first thing we're going to begin with is um, a definition of freedom. So the definition here is from the catechism. It's the power rooted in reason and will to perform deliberate actions on one's own responsibility. So we'll see in the catechism, uh, it's based in reason. And reason is our ability to be able to know the truth. Um, and it's based in our free will, meaning we're ultimately the masters of our own actions. Uh, however, we also would point out that with that freedom comes responsibility. So um, one of the reasons why freedom is such an important topic, especially for Christians, is we must be free to love. Our whole relationship with God is based on the idea that we are able to respond to God's call to love him with our free will. Otherwise, we would be slaves. So free will is really important to the understanding of the relationship between God and others. Now, Christians reject this idea of determinism. Determinism is the idea that every action, event, and decision revolts, results from something independent of human free will. Uh, and determinism comes in a lot of different forms. There's um, a philosophical determinism, biological determinism. Um, for example, a biologist might hold that we are so driven by genetics that we're not able to actually choose anything. And ultimately what these guys would argue is that free will is an illusion. Um, you think you have free will, but in reality you do not. Um, we reject uh, this idea of determinism um, for uh, obviously the philosophical reason um, that if we're not free, we can't choose God. But also think of the idea of our experience. Uh, the idea that we don't have free will uh, totally flies in the face of subjective human experience. We all experience having free will. Now, of course, the, the biologist might argue, well, it's just an illusion, um, but it's an illusion so powerful, one is, uh, it's hard to doubt it. Um, another problem from our perspective with determinism is where does that put responsibility? If ultimately, responsibility, um, if ultimately everything's driven by my genetics, if I'm genetically predisposed to be a murderer, then how can you hold me responsible for that? If I didn't choose to, to kill someone, doesn't that mean that I shouldn't be held to account? So that's another problem with the idea of de determinism. Um, and it's one of the other reasons why ultimately uh, we reject this, the idea that we don't ultimately have free will. So um, we're going to go to the next slide. What is freedom? Now, what we did in class was we asked the question, what is freedom? We already saw from the catechism that it's rooted in both our reason and free will. It's our ability to act and be the masters of our own actions. But before we went into greater detail, I wanted to get um, the students' thoughts about what freedom was before we... Uh, went any further. So we started, uh, this is a typo, it's class work 3.18. So let me, that's my one. Class work 3.18, the concept of freedom. So let me show you that. Um, this is something if you're absent, you will need to make up. Sorry. So after looking at the students' concepts of freedom, uh, we are going to present those, but we need to um, look at some other aspects of freedom. So, for example, we have external freedom. So that means free from factors outside ourselves that would threaten or destroy our power to exercise freedom. So, for example, um, there's the example of being free from poverty. Sorry, this is moving around. It must not be locked. Lock. Okay. So being free 
from poverty. This would be external freedom. It's, it's outside the self. So uh, if you've taken psychology, you might have heard of Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. And what he states is um, in order to, there's a hierarchy of needs. And so at the very top is like self-actualization, becoming the best person you can be. But you can't get there unless you meet more basic needs. So obviously one of the most basic needs at the bottom of the pyramid would be um, things like food and water. If you are in poverty, you're not free to be who you really should be. You're not free to become the best person you can be because you're in a day-to-day -day struggle just to survive. So the idea of expecting someone who's in abject poverty to want to get a job, to go to college, they don't even have the ability to think about that because they have to worry about getting food for the day. So there are external things that can affect our freedom um, and destroy our power to exercise it. Obviously, other big ones you can think of are you know, people who are in situations where they're uh, in captivity. You know, we have... Um, you know, we act like slavery doesn't exist anymore, but it does. There are people who are um, involved in, um, you know, the sex trade who are kept as slaves. And so obviously there are external factors that can affect our freedom. There are also internal factors, states of mind and spirit that um, enable you to reach your full potential or would inhibit you from reaching your full potential. So, um, you know, for example, if you have... Um, you know, you're addicted to drugs. That's an internal thing that would affect your ability to um, reach your full potential as a human. Because again, in the eyes of the Christian, what freedom is, um, is ultimately, it's, it's the human person being fully alive. And so um, there are things that would inhibit that, not just externally, but also internally. So um, we also have to... Uh, distinguish um, freedom from license. Freedom uh, means being able to use reason and will uh, to become who God really wants you to be. Freedom is freedom is for what is freedom for? It's for living our lives for God and others. Um, this is different from license. license. License is freedom run amok or freedom that's not tamed. It's unbridled. It's basically people doing whatever they want or um, anarchy. Freedom run amok. How do you spell run amok? I don't know. Um, but it's, un it's unbridled freedom. It's freedom that's not restrained by reason. Um, so we don't, we don't, um, uh, we distinguish from free freedom from license. Um, even the founding fathers did in founding the country. Um, and there's a quote here from Will Durant, when liberty becomes license, dictatorship is near. And as Christians, um, we would see this as the dictatorship of sin. Um, a lot of students in defining freedom said freedom is doing whatever you want. But there's a problem with that. If, if freedom means doing whatever I want, what if I want to take your purse because I want your money? What if I want to take uh, you as my wife or my, I guess my, um, as my husband, but you don't want to? So it, if freedom means doing whatever I want, that means that people could do whatever they want to you. And again, um, that's what he's talking about, dictatorship. It becomes this um, dictatorship of sin. So we're going to continue looking at that at the next page. So if you go again, we're on, oops, can't okay, say what's going on here. Oh, there we go. So if you go down to the purple chapter three folder, classwork and discussions, we're going to go to 3.18, the concept of freedom. Uh, it's a little laggy. I apologize. Come on. There it goes. So for this assignment, uh, the purpose is to explore the concept of freedom through art. You're going to find an example of your personal understanding of freedom 
and use an example from art, paintings, photography, film, television, poetry, or dance, and explain how it expresses your understanding of freedom. Then you can compare and contrast this understanding with the way that Catholics understand freedom explained in pages 119 to 128 of your book. So here's what you're going to do. Define freedom from both a personal and Catholic perspective. Give evidence from art and writing of your personal concept of freedom. Compare and contrast your concept of freedom with scripture and tradition. And communicate your understanding through a group presentation. Now, if you're absent, um, you could come in and with your made-up slide and add it to your families. Or if you are absent for an extended time, you're just going to make your own slide and turn that into me. So the first part of this assignment was to create a mind map and um, to, sh to show your understanding of freedom. And the paper, I don't sure if I, did I put the paper for the mind map here? Yeah, so see this page here that says um, classwork 3.18? That will show you the mind map and have all the instructions on it. So... Uh, in class, students did a, a mind map of what they thought freedom was, and based on their mind map, they then wrote a, a, a general, where it says define, write your own definition of freedom along the bottom. Next was the step to apply your definition of freedom to an art form. Find a piece of artwork that you feel demonstrates your understanding of freedom symbolically. Be sure to get the attribution, the name of the piece, and also the, the name of the creator and date. Next, you're going to compare and contrast it with the understanding of freedom from the textbook. So three points of comparison. How are they similar? How are they different? So you might have three things that are similar, three things that are different, or a combination of both. And again, you're going to be comparing that to what's in your textbook on pages um, 119 through 128. So um, that's what you're going to look at in your book for the comparison. And then finally, you are going to um, put this together in a presentation with your family. Um, as I said, if you were only absent for one day, you could create your slide and then email it to your family members. Or if you're gone for an extended period of time, you're just going to turn in your single slide. And on the slide, you're going to have your piece of art. So the song, if it's something from a television or a movie, have the clip, a poem, put the poem in there and you can read it to the class. Um, a picture of the artwork with the attribution, your definition of freedom, your compare and contrast with Catholicism, and your name on it. And the rubric is down here below. So here's the rubric we're using. You can read that on your own. Um, but if you go down here, I have um, examples. So I had the example of uh, my mind map that I made, this is where the, the piece of paper on which they made their mind maps, but I had them do it on a hard copy. This is an example of a mind map a student made. Here's more on the Catechism on Freedom, how to make a mind map in 90 seconds. But this PDF right here is, a, is an example slide. So let me show you that. Okay, so this was an example I made to show the students. So you put your family name, St. Hildegard, you wouldn't put that, but just your family name goes there. Um, let me erase that for a second. Okay, so your family name would go there, and then um, you could put, like, uh, the title of the homework there, and then if you scroll down, you'll see an example. So if I were, okay, that's it. So, if I were giving the presentation, this is what I would present. So first of all, this is my um, piece of artwork. It's a photograph. Um, this is uh, was called the German Ship Pennsylvania. The date is 1906, and the photographer's name I couldn't read on the photo, so it's I don't know the photographer's name. Um, but for me, my definition of freedom is knowing the truth of who God meant me to be and having the ability to live my life according to that truth. How is this similar with Catholic teaching? I define freedom as being perfected in God's providence. That means for me to be really free means I'm doing what God um, has planned for me. 
And then freedom is revealed through both reason, a revelation and reason. So I believe that freedom um, is is can be understood both with our the light of human reason, but it also needs to have God's revelation to be fully understood. Um, a big difference between my understanding of freedom and the Catholic textbook is um, the reason why I chose this as my symbol of freedom is because this is the boat that actually brought my grandfather, Pietro Bielik, to the United States. So um, this boat here um, symbolizes freedom to me because I wouldn't have been able to, to be who God meant me to be if he hadn't come to America. So I see freedom in very nationalistic terms. Um, and uh, that's different from the book. In the textbook, they're looking at a much broader definition um, the, of freedom than what I usually think of. I really do associate freedom with being an American. So that's an example of what each slide should look like in your um, PowerPoint presentation. And so the students were given a class, um, a half, a class and a half to get these ready, and then they'll be presenting them the week uh, of the, let's see, it would be what's, the week of the 18th. So um, if you are absent, you do need to make your own slide so I can see how you, your understanding of freedom is before we start the chapter. So now we can move on. Back to the other slide. Sorry. All right, so limits to, wait, oh wait. I, so um, there are limits to freedom. Um, again, we don't believe in license. License would be freedom that's unlimited, um, that's not restrained, but um, there are limits to freedom. And ultimately, it's the abuse of freedom that results in sin. God gave us freedom so that we could be who we were meant to be. Um, not that we could do whatever we want. And um, we also have to always remember original sin made us slaves. Original sin makes us slaves to sin. So if we were in a perfect world, if we were the way God meant us to be, we wouldn't use our freedom in a bad way. But remember, one of the, um, one of the results of original sin is that we have concupiscence. I don't think I spelled that right. Concupiscence um, is this tendency uh, to sin. So when you give a human person a choice between good and evil, we have this tendency toward evil. So, uh, and that's a result of the fall. That's why um, there needs to be limits to human freedom because we're broken and we won't use it properly. Um, remember, as Paul says in Galatians, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. What We aren't free until we have the freedom from original sin. He set us free from original sin so we could be free not to sin. Otherwise, again, we're slaves to sin. There are other limits to freedom, such as um, physical limits, for example, um, not everybody has the same physical condition. For example, I am super short and not particularly athletic. So I, my freedom is limited. I'm not free to be a WNBA player, even if I want to be, because I'm physically incapable of doing so. There's intellectual um, ability. Some people are smarter than others. Um, not everyone can be a rocket scientist. In fact, most of us can't. Um, most people don't have the intellectual ability to become doctors. That's why doctors are so prized and highly regarded in our society because whether consciously or subconsciously, we realize that they're, they um, have a special ability that not everyone else has. And then also we can be limited, limited by our emotions. Um, so for example, if you're a person who is prone to have a temper, you're not as free as someone else to be um, able to express your feelings that that uh, in a way where you're not angry. Um, so you know you might you're not as free. You, you fly off the handle, um, and uh, that's it, where emotions, emotional makeup might limit your freedom. Um, there are also impediments to freedom, and these are important. Impediments to freedom can limit 
Um, your blameworthiness. Blameworthiness or culpability. Again, it wouldn't change the ultimate morality of an action, but um, these things are, are impediments to our freedom. So first one is ignorance. So perhaps you're just ignorant of the rules. Um, you were raised in a, a different culture or no one ever taught you what was right or wrong. Uh, I saw an example of this when I was listening to a Catholic radio program one day. A caller called up and she had no idea that in the teaching of the Catholic Church was that you can't use birth control. So because she was ignorant of the church teaching, um, that limited her blameworthiness for committing the sin of using birth control because she simply didn't know it was wrong. Um, so she's not held to the same level of responsibility as, say, somebody like me who, who knows the full truth of the church teachings. Inadvertence, this would be um, doing something inadvertently, which means doing something without um, meaning to. It's not ex the same exam. It's not the same as ignorance, but it's similar. So um, think about uh, if you're in the car and um, you you're uh, messing with your cell phone, you may inadvertently hit someone. You didn't intend on hitting them, but you were distracted. Um, so you're not completely culpable again because the intention wasn't to hit somebody with the car, but because you were messing with the cell phone, you inadvertently hit them. Um, inordinate attachments. Inordinate attachments is when we become too attached uh, to certain things. Um, there, it's, very, it's very similar to the uh, related to habit. But um, one inordinate attachment many people have is to money. Ultimately, we shouldn't be attached to money. Our, our ultimate attachment should be to God. But when you have the vice of greed, sometimes you'll do things because if you're in a, in inver, inordinately attached to money, money, it's really, it's become so important to you that you might steal. Um, so again, that inordinate attachment would limit some of your blameworthiness. It's still wrong to steal, but, um, you know, inordinate attachments, they, again, they kind of enslave us. Fear or um, another one, uh, fear or duress. If uh, you're under fear or duress, so for example, somebody puts a gun to your head and tells you to rob the liquor store for them, obviously you're not going to be held fully responsible for that because you're, um, you're afraid for your life and you're under duress, someone's pressuring you. And finally, habit. This is why we talked about virtue, um, virtue and vice. Vices are bad habits. So um, once you acquire a bad habit, you tend to do things inadvertently. So for someone who has the vice of alcoholism, um, which is also obviously a medical condition, uh, they will reach for the bottle and drink um, it, it, without even knowing it. It becomes such a habit. And again, um, vice, uh, vices um, don't have to enslave us. That's why God came to set us free from these things. Uh, but uh, again, these are impediments to freedom. In the example of someone who has the vice of, of um, habit or vice of, uh, of doing drugs, they're not free. They're slaves to the drugs. Um, a lot of times in our culture, we have this... Uh, understanding of freedom as like a uh, freedom to choose like freedom means i have uh lock that freedom means i have the right to choice i can choose whatever i want uh, but that's not real freedom because it leads to sins like abortion um freedom again isn't licensed there's a great story of um an experiment they did with monkeys and they put the a little bit of food in a hole and um, the monkey had to reach in to get the food. And so he would uh, open his paw to get the food, but then it wouldn't fit back out the hole. And um, the monkeys would get stuck and then trappers would come and sell them to the pet trade. Uh, so that monkey wasn't free. He was a slave to his desire for that food. Um, and ended up getting put into true slavery, uh, they'd either starve or go into the pet trade. 
Um, that's what our, the worldly understanding of freedom um, gives us. There's also, again, the idea of I could do whatever I want, but that ignores the fact that freedom, it, when we're free, uh, we have a responsibility to God and to each other. Um, I'm not free to take somebody else's purse because I have a responsibility to not only to myself, but to the community. So um, let's continue by looking at the role emotions play in our freedom. Okay, so, um, oops, it didn't go. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at on the topic of freedom before we look at responsibility is the emotions. Um, in Catholic thought, they're often called the passions. Um, and um, sometimes they're also called the uh, appetites. Uh, or um, desires. And if you want to find out where this is in the catechism, if you looked at numbers 1762 through um, 1775, they have a really short, um, pithy description that's very good if you'd like it. So the passions include love, which is the most important um, and the one that should gover govern all. Um, and again, the catechism um, following St. Thomas Aquinas defines love as to will the good of the other. Then there is desire, joy, sadness, fear, and anger. So those are um, our emotions, and they're um, a natural part of who we are, and they're morally neutral. So they're amoral. Um the passions are something that are innate to us and they're natural. So in and of themselves, they don't have a moral quality. But the catechism teaches that they're good when they lead us to do something good. So when they're ordered to the good. And again, we're going to use this word ordered a lot. Um, you could change it to oriented if you wanted. When they're oriented to the good, your emotions are good. But they're bad when they um, lead you to do something evil or they're oriented toward the, e the bad thing. Or, I don't know if I spelled that right, toward bad. So that would get, make them bad. Being ordered to the good would make them good. So again, it's what we do with our emotions that counts. Remember the moral object. The object is what you do. Um, it doesn't matter what your intentions are. So um, it's very important that we train our will um, in the virtues to channel our emotions toward the good. So um, let's see. We have to use our reason um, to govern our passions. In the Catechism in number 1767, they write, In and of themselves, the passions are neither good nor evil. They are morally qualified only to the extent they, they effectively engage reason and will. Um, again, so the will is the acting self and the w reason is the thinking self. So um, it says, it continues, the upright will orders the movements of the senses and it, it appropriates to the good and to uh, beatitude and evil will succumbs uh, to disordered passions and exacerbates them so again the will um uh is the way we can order our passions um let's see let's see it says here the moral perfection consists in a man's being moved to the good not by his will alone but also by his sensitive appetites so ultimately um we have to train um, our will and the virtues to help us to channel our emotions toward the good. Um, and again, how do we know what's good? How do we know what's bad? We look to our objective moral norms. And that's what we're going to look at in the second part of the chapter.
So if I want to order my will toward the good, how do I know what's good? God gave us the law to teach us that. So that way we can order our will toward the good. We can, and again, the way you do that is by practicing the virtues. And the more you do virtues, the more, the easier they become because they become habit. And the same is with vices. So the next section we're going to look at, we're going to look at, well, how do I know what the good is? We're going to look at objective moral norms that will help us to order our will toward the good. Um, so thank you for uh, listening to this lecture. And if you have any questions, please email me.